All right, go to the first slide. Um, I'm going to read some of these slides because I know I know you all like to hear people read slides, so I'll read a few of them. <laughs> so in 2018 and 2019, we held a couple of a few workshops. Uh, three of them were federal at the FCC headquarters, and one of them was at uh, Dayton. And it came from the Hurricane Maria aftermath, where, as Oscar knows very well, didn't go too well. And they finally asked a question about amateur radio. And at the workshop, uh, these are the, were the participants, the panelists, actually, at the one at uh, Dayton. And of course, some of the names have changed, like uh, Spectrum Manager for FEMA changed, and uh, the Shares PM has also changed, as you all know. These are were the main people who participated in that, just FYI. So as you all know, the 27 hurricane season was a real opportunity to examine our real world lessons learned in a disaster emergency communications environment. And Puerto Rico in a particular really challenged the comms infrastructure like no other US disaster in our memory. <clears throat> so the purpose of the workshops was to ask for solutions to the issues that were raised during the public comment period. And uh, there were quite a few over, I think 43 total came up to us and uh, there are a lot of things to read. So in a public notice, this is what the question that we asked, and that is to what extent were response efforts facilitated by amateur radio operators? And should efforts be made to increase the use of amateur radio services in the future? So uh, this is the usual thing we have to say in all our presentations where what we say here does not necessarily reflect the positions of the commission or the interagency. And many, most of the issues that came about really were not related to a public notice for, or NPRMs or rulemaking, but rather required interagency coordination at all levels of government from uh, you know, city, county, state, federal. So the top three uh, issues here, Well, the ones that we're going to have in this presentation. That's why this presentation won't, la won't last very long. <laughs> okay, number one, urgent need to remove the symbol rate limit for HF digital communications. This has been a long time running. And I have had so many phone calls and emails about this one particular issue. And it, um, it really started around 2015 when the first report and order was written by uh, Bill Cross before he left the commission. And there is still a need for that uh, report in order to be published, as you all know. But the main reason is the increased throughput without increased signal bandwidth through the elimination of the current speed limit would significantly increase message delivery speed, interoperability, and frequency availability, and would reduce crowding in the very limited band of frequencies that are used for digital signals that support critical over-the-air email delivery, as you all know. So the solution, which we said, which has been suggested by many people, is obviously to remove the symbol rate limit in the rules. And there's the rule right there on the slide. You just cross out that one uh, phrase there, and you're pretty much good to go. In support of the, uh, that rule in particular, and a few others, we received a letter from uh, John O'Connor who directs the National Coordination Center and he's still there the, for communications. And you can see the highlighted area where he says, we asked the commission to review those aspects of part 97 of their rules relating to emergency communications, including operational and technical restrictions which limit the use of new technologies. Also in support, you'll see here that the North and South Carolina also, and Tennessee by the way, agree with the need to remove the 300 baud symbol rate. There are other states that also agree. I just got this slide from the um, North Carolina Rat Pack briefing. I just included it here to show you the support, but there are many other states that also support it. They just didn't, haven't done a briefing yet. Here's another example of support for the, uh, from Washington State, crossing out that one phrase, getting rid of the symbol rate limit. <clears throat> Uh, uh, before I go on number two, are there any questions? Because I don't want to uh, bog this thing down because it's going to go fairly quickly. 
you have any questions of civil rights, uh, I guess you could uh, speak up or put something in the uh, chat. I don't know how y'all do these uh, briefings. Well, we normally have them raise their hand. We've got a hand raised by Dan now. Dan, go ahead for a second, get a question. Yeah, hello, Bart, and thank you for making this presentation. Is anybody objecting to this change? Bart? Bart, did you hear that? I, I can't hear that at all. Dan, say it again. Yeah, first, hello, Bart. Thank you for making this presentation. Do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you now. Okay. Is there anybody against making this change? Oh, you're asking me that question. I thought you were asking yeah. the, uh, everyone else. <laughs> That's excellent. No, I only know of one individual in the world who actually doesn't want this to go through. And uh, he uh, he's written several inputs. He has a few people that's, that he has gotten to support him. He works at uh, New York University. Okay. And I have talked to him several times about it. He has agreed, and then he changes his opinion. So I don't know why, but uh, he's the only guy I know. I have to do a little background on him to figure that out. Yeah. Um, so, thanks. Yeah, any other questions on that one? Oscar, is that a question you have in there? Actually, it's more like a comment because if you also increase the bandwidth, you can increase the most important factor, this signal to noise ratio. As well, when you have good condition, you can increase the speed. But more important in case of a real emergency is to get that message through the noise from point A to point B or out of the impact zone. Back to you, Bart. Right. Thank you, Oscar. Okay, the issue number two, uh, the concern here is that operators should be able to program their radios to monitor for emergency traffic on one frequency per HF band, rather than continuously scanning all the HF band frequencies for emergency traffic. And there's a related issue to this one, and that is specific frequencies that would be assigned for emergency traffic. Okay, so the solution would be to designate by an FCC rule that it would be an MCOM calling or monitor frequency on each HF band to facilitate stations to monitor for MCOM traffic. And um, just as those frequencies that are recommended by the IARE region two, and it's noted in the NIFOG, which you all are probably aware of, and the OXFOG by DHS. Okay, and here's some support for that. The uh, North and South Korea, uh, Korea, <laughs> North and South Carolina agree with the need for an MCOM only HF monitor or calling frequency as does uh, Tennessee and some other states. And here's some more support from Washington state, same difference. And then we also have from the Hurricane Maria hot wash, they also agree that we needed, and, and particularly related to wind lake use. And here's a slide from another presentation from uh, FEMA. FEMA also agrees with the need. FEMA has been very vocal about the need to get this done, especially um, their uh, spectrum manager. And he has since been replaced, but the new one is also a ham and uh, he also agrees. And they agree with the solution. Okay, are there any questions on number two? The uh... We got a couple of hands up here. Uh, okay. We got some comments in the text. Marty, go ahead with your, with your question. All right, thank, there's thank several Marty, several okay. Marty's. Which, yeah, we which got two Marty? of them here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Marty SM KB3 MXM, go ahead. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Hi Bart, you you and I have met a couple of times while in DC. So what about 60 meters? I mean, there is um, there uh, that already being channelized. Sometimes those are uh, already designated for interoperability. How does the designated, how will it designate for the 60 meters or will you not designate one of those for that reason? I'm not sure 60 meters would be included, but what has to happen on this particular idea is the FCC has to be requested to do this. In other words, 
the, either the states or, organi or an organization needs to come in and ask for this particular thing. And then we, at that point, we start a notice of proposed rulemaking or actually our public notice, one of the two, and ask for comments from the community. And that will take normally up to about nine months to happen. Rulemakings are, are time intensive normally. And after that, the commission puts together all the comments and then they come up with it with their solution. And of course, this would be in the uh, the wireless telecommunications bureau. It would not be in my bureau. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Marty uh, in six vi. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, would based on the proposals you've heard so far, would these uh, set aside frequencies be restricted only during a uh, federally declared or state declared emergency, or are these like hands off twenty four seven? Well, from what I've seen and what has been asked for, it would be 24 seven. It would be permanent calling frequency, and then you move to another frequency and, or it would be a MCOM frequency. For example, you, you might remember the old uh, RACIES rules that had all those uh, frequencies that were set aside for MCOM. It would be similar to that, I think. <clears throat> okay, got a question in chat. Now, Barry, you want to, I'm taking your thunder away. Go ahead, Barry, with the questions in chat. Hello, Barry. Well, Barry's gone away. The chat is- I got it. What frequencies have been suggested so far? This is from George in Washington. Uh, the only thing that we, I've heard so far is that one frequency per band and the middle of the band is what's preferred because it's easier to, to tune antennas at the middle of the band, so. Okay, <clears throat> but, that's the only question that I've seen. Okay, Joe, go ahead there, Wisconsin. Joe, Wisconsin, <laughs> N9TWA, go ahead. Yeah, it helps if I unmute, sorry about that. Um, those frequencies, are they only available for actual emergencies or could they be used for training purposes? I would say that they should be included for training because um, it only makes sense. You always want to, like we do in the army, uh, you train to fight and you know, or you fight like you train, same difference. So yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Steve, you got it there in Tennessee. Okay, one thing I wanted to bring up here that uh, is very important <clears throat> that uh, Bart uh, mentioned is the FCC doesn't make up rules. They respond to requests for a notice for proposal for rulemaking. They respond to a request. And if they want to, they'll uh, then carry that forward and um, maybe modify it or uh, research it or listen to comments or do whatever they do, but they don't generate new rules. So uh, what, this, uh, what the states are, from what I can understand, are interested in is something similar to part 97407, which was the old Conrad or civil defense or races uh, uh, before internet, before anything. And uh, they, uh, they understand that there are a myriad of non-channelized frequencies within the amateur spectrum. And if somebody needed a call frequency uh, in a, an actual emergency or for a planned exercise approved by whoever uh, uh, the, you know, the uh, requester suggests, or whatever the results of the FCC's um, uh, docket or, or, or report and order may say, um, there's, it, it's all up in the air. So it's hard for anybody to answer the questions when the, uh, when the suggestion has not been proposed to the FCC to date. Uh, so some organization or a group of states or a group of any uh, authorities having jurisdiction that feel strongly about this. Uh, the uh, objective is to get uh, consolidated uh, approval of each entity, each authority, and uh, move forward with a suggestion to the FCC. And that uh, is becoming stronger and stronger as the OXCOM concept is becoming uh, uh, to fruition. Um, of course, uh, with the 
problems we've had with uh, uh, the pandemic and virtual classes, it has not been helpful, but it didn't slow anything down. If you look at each of the states and the FEMA organization that uh, has spoken, every one of them took uh, North Carolina's initial statement and rubber stamped it. They all want this. Um, you've got to remember that we've got severe content restrictions. Uh, our messages are open to the public uh, and by law. And uh, there's nowhere that we know that we could uh, alight if a real emergency did take place or somebody and even an individual was uh, in severe uh, difficulty. There's nowhere that that one individual could go and uh, know that he would be heard somewhere by somebody. So the mechanism for all that is all up in the air and uh, you could discuss it until the cows come home, but the discussions mean nothing until somebody proposes something to the FCC. Uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's all I had to say about it. And I know that the states are very much in favor of it because they've had issue after issue in determining frequencies and then being clobbered by a contest or uh, whatever. So uh, it is a real live uh, need and uh, sooner or later, hopefully sooner, uh, an organization, uh, maybe a formal organization will grab hold of that and do something with it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, there's a couple of things here in the chat. You wanna pick those up, uh, Barry? It's just comments. I don't have, I don't see any questions. Well, there's uh, Marty's got a question mark there. Recommended designated high frequency uh, HF ecom frequency be available for digital and voice. You got okay, because I'm looking for the cues before the questions. And okay, uh, oh, yeah. there is one from Steve in Colorado, but I'm going to answer that in private in private chat. Okay, sounds good. Uh, let's go on with, oh, wait a minute, Marty, get your, your hand up, we'll catch you, then we'll go on with the presentation. <clears throat> um, all right, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I, I thought I typed the cue there. Yeah, my comment, my comment was that, that that designated frequency, given the, you know, the conversation here, uh, the designated frequency uh, capable of digital end voice, um, you know, in the sense that voice is that real-time environment where like on the marine bands, if someone calls on a voice channel, it usually gets immediate response. Right. right. And the digital is is more of the empirical data, like send me the list of school buses available or something like that. So just a comment. Thank you very much, Dan, for recognizing me. Not a problem. Not a problem. Go ahead, Bart. Take it away. Yeah, my, my recommendation would be to have not just a single frequency, but actually a, a tiny band. So you could have it both digital and voice single sideband on there. Great and, suggestion, and great suggestion. The, one thing I wanted to mention though with that, with that um, is very concerning is that the current rule says you, you can use any frequency on any band for emergencies. But the problem with that rule is that as you all know, if you've ever been in a contest, I'm sure you all have been, there are people all over the place. And if you wanna call SOS anywhere on the bands, good luck, anybody hearing you, especially if you have a weak signal. Like let's say you're a QRP or somewhere and you're, you're, in, you're hiking and you have an emergency. Are you gonna get through during a contest? Highly unlikely. But if you have a designated frequency to call on and that frequency is kept clear, then you have a better chance of somebody hearing you. I mean, it's just my opinion, you know. That's why Marty, I think it's useful. Marty, you got your hand up again? Yeah, so Bart, um... You know, the Maritime Service Net operates on 14300. Right. And and so does the Intercom Net and very well, you know, well publicized and supported. And, you know, they have their I'll, I'll refer to them as their their uh, frequency bouncers who like to say that's in use. And that's in use. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I see that if so, if I was going to be calling for help, I certainly if I hear somebody on some other channel and they're all contesting, you know, I'm going to jump in there because somebody will hear me. Um, I think the idea, the, I think the idea is, is that you designate the frequency and it's designated ahead of time 
because we've got, for example, we've got the volcano going in La, La, Pla, uh, La Plama and we had uh, earthquakes in Mexico and we had catastrophes in Puerto Rico. And then we don't hear from the ITU, you know, sometimes until afterwards or from the league afterwards, it says that it's been requested. These frequencies remain clear. So the idea is, you know, right. I, I hate to use the, I hate to coin the term. It's, it's basically channel CB channel nine. Don't get on it. Just don't yeah. get there. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. Thanks. There's there's plenty of precedence and you have channel 16, you have 121.5, you have other frequencies that Absolutely. already are like that. And uh, why not do it for the handbands? I don't see any reason why not. It makes sense. But somebody has to ask it or, or it won't get done. Yeah, we've got to find the okay, Steve. Go ahead. Uh, the uh, you've mentioned the NIFOG. You have interoperability and mutual aid frequencies that are common to all uh, public safety, LMR, uh, everybody. You have uh, if you if you have a, a VHF radio, uh, you can get on and talk to somebody on uh, using a trunking radio on eight hundred on on. Uh, uh, mutual aid and inter interoperability frequencies, uh, depending upon whether it's in state, out of state, federal or involved, et cetera, et cetera. There are parameters and specific rules for that. And there's no question. There's no uh, confusion. Everybody knows what they are. They're already programmed, et cetera. Great. But that does not apply to the Maritime Mobile Service Net. If I got on the Maritime Mobile Service Net and said, excuse me, fellas, we've got an improved exercise and we'll be using these frequency, this frequency for the next uh, four and a half, five hours or four and a half or five days, that won't cut it. The, what's needed is a specific uh, designated group of frequencies that will handle whatever protocol, whether it be digital voice, analog voice, CW, whatever, whatever is, uh, gets through, uh, uh, orthotical frequency division, multiplex, wind link protocol, whatever, uh, to, to uh, have that set up and have the rules made. And we can sit and discuss all of this all day long, but nothing's going to happen unless we get uh, aggressive and uh, suggest this to our uh, to our agencies that they get together and propose something. And uh, this is a, every, every, uh, every proposal like this starts somewhere. And this is as good a place as any to start it. Um, we've had five or six agencies uh, on a state level and a federal level tell us they want it. So it's up to, to us to, uh, to assist those agencies in providing the mechanism to get it done. Uh, that, that's it. Uh, Bart, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. No, you're absolutely right. Somebody has to ask it. And the it's always better if a state uh, government asks for it rather than an individual. It has, because usually they'll make it very formal and it'll, it'll be taken more seriously, unfortunately. I mean, anybody can send in a request, but normally when a state government does or another federal agency does, it's, uh, it's usually acted upon fairly quickly. And <clears throat> it doesn't always take nine months to do a, a rulemaking, but depending on what the rulemaking is about, it could take a while for the, the attorneys and the engineers to understand the issue themselves and to research it so that they understand what the issue is and how it works. There are some technologies that for them that require some, some research because they're not familiar with it. You, you, you might not know this, but there are very, very, very few hands at FCC headquarters. And the few that there are, are mostly technicians. I think there's one other extra there and he doesn't work with rule makings at all. He's a good contester though. <laughs> and uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, FCC used to have a lot of amateur radio operators and very few left. I think there's maybe 15 in the, the entire agency. So moving on to the next uh, slide, if I can get it to work, there we are. Okay, this is an interesting issue. There's no national 
plan for using amateur radio MCOM for disaster response. But this, what this is talking about is not local areas or even states, but really when you have to support something outside of the state or your state and you need help, there are EMACs and other organizations that do that. But like if we had to support Puerto Rico again, another disaster, heaven forbid, um, there's no plan that says, okay, here's, here's a roster of people who have volunteered. Let's call them and ask them if they'll go, you know, if they don't have a, an emergency where they are right now. That would probably be useful. And the, that would be the, res, the solution would be develop the plan. And uh, you'd have to work it with a lot of other agencies, obviously, and uh, make some memorandum of agreements and whatever is necessary. But I think that because there are so many organizations involved that there, there would have to be some kind of coordination to get this thing going. Because you can you all remember, and I think Oscar could probably talk to this, in what happened in in Puerto Rico, we had, it was mostly ad hoc, the response to it in terms of amateur radio. It was not that well organized in general. Eventually, some people got their act together, but I would say you don't want to have to do the coordination on the fly. You want to have that done ahead of time so that you can at least do something and send some, some people very quickly. <clears throat> so anyone have any questions on uh, the last solution or any others? We had a couple from beforehand. Uh, Marty's got a question there. Go ahead, Barry, read it, if you would. I don't see it. Since the FCC rules apply to the U.S. And, uh, okay, I see it now. Okay, since FCC rules apply only to U.S. amateurs, how could we expect the designated frequencies to be kept clear by DX stations, contesters, or otherwise? Um, that's a that's an excellent question. You might have to go to the IARU and ask them for help with the other okay. regions in the world. The uh, there's no other way to get that fully coordinated without doing that, and then that's their job is to coordinate stuff like that. And I think. It, we're probably, mm -hmm. it's long overdue, my opinion. How hard is it to get the FCC to designate, a, when an event happens, to designate a frequency for emergency use on the fly? It's not hard at all. They can do it in five minutes. And mm -hmm. they've, done it, they've done things that quickly in the past. The, the, the problem we face, though, is, is they don't want to do it now because the rules that are written, as written today, say that any frequency can be an emergency frequency and we're not going to designate any frequencies for that at this time. However, if you go back to the old system where we where we used to do that, that worked pretty well overall. And you had to kick people off their their daily, uh, you know, rack chew nets or whatever, because almost every frequency, if you look at the assignments of frequencies, the informally assigned ones that everyone thinks they own the frequency where they're rack chewing, you'll see that almost all the frequencies are taken. If you're looking like to start a new net somewhere, which I've done in the past, it's very hard to find a clear frequency at most times of the day. Mm -hmm. I remember 640 and 1240. Yeah, Conrad. <laughs> okay, I think we're done unless you see some more bearing. Nope, that was the only one that I saw. Okay, Bart, back to you. Okay, well, um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to brief this. Uh, I could have brought some more issues, but I thought that those those were the top three by far, and the ones I've received the most calls about. And uh, but if you really want the commission to to help you with something, you have to get together with with either an organization like the AWRL or other any other organization that has a vested interest in this to get stuff done. It's a it can be a fast process or a slow process, depending on how urgent the matter is and how convincing your argument is and how much data you have to support it. Uh, you do have some people with uh, opinions that are not based on science, unfortunately, and that's just the way stuff is. Remember, we're in a very um, technical hobby and not everybody understands even what symbol rate is or how to calculate symbol rate for that matter. Uh, when you're an engineer and you go to school, if you look at the curriculum for double E's uh, at the bachelor's, master's, and PhD level, which I have actually done research on, you will not find any core requirement for RF engineering. None. Zero. You will find a chapter in a book that talks about RF. 
in general. So when you have engineers that, that go and work for any, for the government, as an example, they're generally not going to understand RF. That's why I spent a lot of my time at the commission on the whiteboards explaining some very basic stuff like, you know, wave propagation, some circuits. I mean, it's really, it's just the way our educational university system is set up. And when we try to get uh, engineers from, uh, from industry, well, good luck because they make a lot more money <laughs> than the federal government pays. And that's just the way we are today. It's a sad thing. But if you look in all the agencies, I, I worked in five federal agencies now, and every one of them had the exact same problem. And as you might know, every federal agency, without exception, no exception, uses contractors to run their IT systems. So what does that tell you? That tells you that we don't, the federal government doesn't have very many technical experts, not only IT, but in RF. So that's a, a constant challenge. So when you write to the FCC, for example, and you have a technical question or issue, what you have to do is write it in layman's terms as much as possible. And that's what I've had to do since I've been at the commission, you know, since 09. And I was very surprised to learn that, but that's just the way things are. Uh, you, very few people understand or even bother to get educated on this stuff. And uh, we've got a couple of hands up here. It looks like our, both our Marty's are pretty active. N6BI, go ahead, Marty. Uh, thank you. Uh, unrelated to the specific presentation, but to the FCC, uh, there's been discussion out for some time that the FCC is considering uh, a rewrite of the uh, <clears throat> of the uh, uh, its its rules in general, uh, presumably including those that affect amateur radio. Um, have you any insight into where that process stands and whether there is any? risk to amateur radio at this point from such a rewrite should it occur? Well, in every administration, whenever the administration changes, there are some changes that they try to make in the rules. And one of the things that they always say in every administration is, oh, we need to rewrite the rules and make them flow. If you look at the ham rules, for example, you will find that not every issue is in the same paragraph or in the same section of the rules because they've updated the rules at some point in the past and it doesn't flow together. You want to get an answer to the question, you got to go two different places in the rules, for example. That's what they're talking about on rewrites is just making it more understandable and making it flow together. And then what happens is during the four-year administration's term, oh, we're running out of time or we don't have enough people to do this because it actually takes quite a bit of time to make the rules flow together that makes sense. But all the rules in all, in all of 47 CFR are like that, not just the amateur radio section. So wow. no, I'm, I'm not, I haven't heard about any rewriting in that regard because if there was a serious rewrite, uh, they have to do a, a, the usual notice of proposed rulemaking, get comments back and from the public and all that. So it's not likely that that's gonna happen the way it's, the way you made it sound. <clears throat> Okay, the other Marty, uh, KD3MXM, go ahead. Hey, Bart, let me ask you this question. I'm just not familiar with this. I probably have somebody on my staff that knows more than I do about this kind of stuff. But what's the, what's the relationship between NTIA and FCC? And how does, as the topics you mentioned this evening, is, is that a, is that a equality of some sort? Or, or how does that, how does that work? The NTIA relationship with FCC is very good from what I've seen, at least when I've okay. had to deal with them. The, uh, they have similar issues with staffing. Uh, they have actually a huge issue with staffing right now. We, we actually got one of their, one of their uh, engineers came to us uh, not long ago, last summer. And uh, hiring is extremely difficult these days uh, for a couple of reasons. One, everybody blames COVID on it, but COVID is related to it. We, uh, when we lose somebody, it's hard to bring someone new on board. It just takes forever, it seems like. And they, um, there's always a shortage of people. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, since I work continuity there, when I was at DHS Intel, I had, let's see, I had 12 employees, right, to do the work. And it, it was an adequate number. And they had only 628 people in that agency when I was there. They have more now. No, 
the FCC with 2,000 people only has one professional continuity person. That's me, who's fully trained. And they have a few, we have two others who work it. But, and that's it. I mean, that's for the whole program. So there's a ton of work that you have to do to make things work. Because, you know, the, the government loves bureaucracy. They love paperwork. Mm -hmm. They love filling out forms and stupid things. And exercises are, are the one thing that they do that is important, I think, because, you know, you have to, uh, you fight like you train, so to speak. So th that, that's a continuing issue. Uh, but I would, NTIA and FCC go along pretty well. I, I, I'm, I can't think of any issues right now that are of any significance. Sometimes you have personality issues, but overall, we, NTIA did lose one a ham who worked there. And that was a significant loss because he, he was the only one. I'm trying to think of his name right now. He retired. Steve. A, huh? Steve. Steve, that's right. And he, you know, as he, as you all know, he passed away. Um, so. mm -hmm. Well, I worked with, uh, I worked with uh, Roberto Musselman and, and John O'Connor down in, in Puerto Rico. You know, I was there uh, right. working with the SF2 teams and, and I was the uh, facilitator for the comms IT sector congressional report and um you mentioned about the uh about the uh, amateur radio response and and i'm sure you've seen this as well that uh it was uh it was haphazard on all rf i mean even mars was a bit uh you know a bit uh, delayed in getting i mean it was the infrastructure was decimated right. um and while there was no immediate comms coming from puerto rico there was certainly an abundance of comms that was occurring in the States um, at that particular time. And uh, that's why I asked you the relationship between those two organizations, because at that time there, I think there was a, a sense that uh, there was, uh, you, you know, you want this, but you know, you're not getting any more than what you have. You know, you're not getting any more bands. You're not getting more frequency. You're not getting, you know, there was whole. Well, that's what the that's what the you know that's what it was. And then in hindsight, you look back, reading the Katrina report, the Sandy report, and the Puerto Rico report, and you quickly realize that it's a it's a benefit that just isn't I think appreciated in that in that sense. You know, at the time, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and you know, it points back to, to very common issues, and I'll, I'll just bring up one: the. Uh, ESF2 in Puerto Rico was not a COMEL trained person. And mm. that hurts a lot, in my opinion. COMEL is a very good course, I think. And if you don't even have that basic amount of knowledge, how are you going to run? How are you going to tell people, okay, your antenna is too close to that one, or you move over here? You won't even know that you have to do that. And you're going to have all kinds of RF interference. People don't, don't know how to use their own radios. It's, it's a sad state of affairs, but it goes back to technical competence and training. And if you don't have someone on board who can, who understands that or is willing to learn, you really, that's why I think a national plan with, with some might help. I don't know. You know, you don't mm -hmm. have much right now. If we had another incident like that happen today, I'm not sure we'd do any better than we did then. I think we would. I, I think we, we would. And I'll, I'll tell you why I think we would. Mm -hmm. Because at that particular time, the backbone infrastructure across the public service, uh, the emergency comm sector, was all basically a microwave backbone. So that entire system was de heavily dependent that all the dishes line up with all the towers so that the police, the fire, and everybody could talk. Right. Um, as soon as that backbone was interrupted, those dishes were off center, and uh, and that was destroyed, and that was. Um, um, that was devastated, you know, decimated. Mm -hmm. it, it trickled down. Doctors at hospitals couldn't get pages because right. the, the, from the tower that they could see on the mountain because the back won't. So I, I don't agree. I believe that that the resiliency is is much improved. And I think the appreciation for point to point communications is much more realized than it was before. Well, that, that's good to hear that. Does Oscar have anything to say about that? Is he still here? He's still, he's still, yeah, I think he's still. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, uh, well, there were a lot of things that came out on, on the after action reports that were not publicized. So there are a lot of things that I think were relatively catastrophic 
in terms of pre preparation and, and operation that should have gone a whole lot better. And of course, now I come from a military background where, you know, we have a lot more assets and you get in a lot of trouble if you did what happened in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Weren't ready for it. Well, we had the same problem in California, Bart. Same yeah. situation in the mountains of California when the wildfires burnt up all of the uh, public service towers. Not burnt them up, but you know it interrupted that that backbone of communications. And um, mm -hmm. you know the amateur radio community se certainly stepped in, but they were also affected, right? right? Their their infrastructure, their their networking, and their link systems were on the same towers, my friend. Same towers. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But thank got, you. Of all the things that amateur radio has, from, from my perspective, I would say the best tool available is WinLink by far. And for several reasons. One is it's just like regular email for the, the user to use it. And if you're supporting an agency, which normally you are, they'll understand it and see that. And it's fairly, it's very fast compared to other modes. I just wish we had more space in the uh, subbands that because when I've tried to log in to WinLink, oh, good luck. There's always someone there I got to wait for, wait and wait and wait. It's because there's, there's so many people trying to squeeze into a tiny number of frequencies that mm -hmm. it's just hard to get stuff through. And in an emergency, you're going to have more. So it's not big enough for, and I think if you look at the bigger picture, what's more important in amateur radio of all the things that we do? Well, clearly emergencies are more important. So why aren't we supporting that? like we should be rather than supporting other things like, okay, contest and that's fun, but, and other nets are, are great, but emergencies are number one in my book. And if you're not ready for that, you're not really serving the public like, like you should. <clears throat> Say it again. Say it again. Okay. Let's pick up Dan over there. Uh, yeah. uh, go ahead, Dan. Okay. I, sometimes I just can't help myself from stirring the pot. Um, <laughs> So CISA shares kind of addresses the issue of suitable frequency access. And it also kind of informs us that the FCC may not see, as they've said recently, uh, and quite emphatically, the amateur radio service as an emergency communication service. So somehow um, I, and I guess I have to do this in the form of a question. In, in your position, especially with experience in five different federal agencies, how do you feel or how do you think the pertinent federal agencies feel about elevating uh, the level of training by using OXCOM as a pinnacle prerequisite course um, for amateurs that can use their skills and abilities, but in an environment where the frequency burden is not an issue. And Steve is the great advocate of CISA shares because he's got something there. And well, I'm just curious yeah. because you seem focused on, you know, I read MCOM, Amateur Radio's Highest Calling. Well, I believe that for the first 20 some years of being an amateur. <laughs> and then I started seeing what did and didn't work. Um, so, I, you know, I'm real curious about what it looks like from your position. Well, I'll give you an interesting example is the last uh, Hurricane Ida. I was very, very surprised. Uh, for the first time, I was asked to uh, do some outreach and find out what the hams were doing for MCOM. And I was, I was both uh, surprised and happy at the same time. So the surprise was shares was not used, bottom line. It was ready to use in some places, but it was bottom line, it was not used. And I had a very hard time getting any information out of the shares management at all. That was very upsetting. And shares uses NTIA frequencies and not FCC frequencies, which makes it a whole lot easier to use in general. And it should have been, but couldn't get anything out of it as far as from my perspective, and I tried the best. Now, the, believe it or not, the best response came from the ARIES, Amateur Radio Emergency Service from ARRL. They did, compared to everybody else, the best job out there, and they gave daily reports. And now the hurricane went by quickly, relatively quickly, compared to other ones. 
So there wasn't that much response actually needed in general, but they were ready compared to any other organization that we normally deal with. Uh, Mars was not uh, used, either Air Force or, or Army, not used at all. And what are the others? Um, Saturn was not used. Um, trying to think of any other organizations. But so by speaking, I, I expected shares to be used immediately because it's such a good network in terms of frequency availability and the ability to get in, into th those frequencies and use them. But I just didn't see it. And uh, it's unfortunate, but that's just the way it happened for that hurricane. Maybe that's an outlier. Maybe that won't happen the next time there is a hurricane or something. But if you're going to train and have hundreds of stations ready and an event actually occurs, it behooves those stations to get on the air and say, okay, you got some message to pass and traffic to pass. I mean, come on. Why would you go through all that trouble and all these practice nets and everything? And then when an actual emergency comes, nothing happens. So that was, that was very concerning from that perspective. And Aries did a fairly good job that time. Yeah, that's good to hear. We have two more hands up. Oscar woke up finally. So, um, uh, Steve, we'll catch you because I think you you got something relative to this. You want me to go? Okay. Yes. Uh, the, man, the the individual that uh, Bart is talking about uh, that uh, really spearheaded everything amateur radio um, for Hurricane Ida was a man named Jim Coleman, who was an ESF2 uh, and an EMA in a parish down in Louisiana and connected uh, directly with the governor's office of Homeland Security uh, for Louisiana. And he did a, ex an excellent job of keeping everybody informed. Um, I took his daily uh, uh, outlook, uh, which didn't really use a lot of amateur radio, but it they were prepared. They were there. Uh, communications was not a great big deal in this particular hurricane relative to other hurricanes. Um, so uh, to be really uh, down to it, uh, it was Jim Coleman's efforts uh, to inform everyone, uh, including FEMA and the FCC and other amateur radio operators and anybody that uh, wanted the information on a daily hot wash about what was taking place and what had happened during the last uh, 24 hours of that, that event. That made a big difference because it gave others an opportunity to see how it all works. And uh, uh, got to give that guy a lot of credit. He didn't have to fool with amateur radio. He had plenty to do with his own parish and his state, but uh, he did step forward he did use the ARL, uh, ARES uh, mechanism, and uh, it was successful. Uh, and as far as uh, Puerto Rico goes, um, there were a lot of problems in Puerto Rico dealing with RF that didn't have a thing to do with amateur radio or shares, had more to do with satellite interference and other uh, uh, management issues from my understanding. And, uh, and that's also true of the amateur radio uh, fiasco that took place down there, um, which is one of the reasons why uh, BART is able to refer back to these slides because they wanted to improve. Uh, they wanted to improve the situation. And several people have mentioned John O'Connor, who runs a national communications court. Well, they changed the name of it. I don't know what it is now. NCC which is a major part of uh, uh, the Department of Homeland Security's communications mechanism. Uh, used to be National Coordinating Center for Communications, but they changed the name. At any rate, he uh, responded to the FCC's uh, comments in a public comment and stated that he stated two things. One, that uh, amateur radio played an important role and they need to continue to play an important role, not only on their own bands, but he also uh, mentioned shares, uh, sister shares, uh, because if you think about it, uh, the reserves in an agency are the ones that, that, that move shares forward. 
it isn't so much the employees. The employees may provide some funding. Employees on the uh, may uh, provide some management, but it's the hams that are moving it forward. And uh, and he realizes that and made that comment. He also made a second comment that he would uh, recommend that the FCC relook at the rules that are there and uh, consider uh, obtaining uh, advice for revision uh, to more fully uh, take advantage of uh, amateur radio for an emergency service. So there's a lot going on. The problem is there's no organization that has come forward and uh, put a stamp on this thing and send it to the FCC for their consideration. Um, and that's something that uh, that uh, is still up in the air. When we have, when we get through with this call, is there anybody that's going to move forward in this uh, with this subject and try to uh, move mm. this thing forward uh, through some authority having jurisdiction or an organization of those people, like the National Council uh, of SWICs, etc. Uh, so there's a lot of, or APCO, there's a lot of things that could be done that aren't being done because they just aren't. Nobody's taking the, the lead. Okay. Uh, you want to comment to that there, Bart? No, uh, Steve makes a very good uh, point. Um, I have other comments I'd like to say, but I, uh, I have to bite my tongue sometimes. So, uh, you know. Well, let's let Oscar of of get in there. He, he has a tendency to, <laughs> to take care of all that for us. Oscar, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. My name is Oscar Resto, KP4 Radio Fox, and uh, we were uh, quite active during Utica Maria. Actually, Utica Maria, for just refreshing your memory, was a, an event, a catastrophe event that Ham Radio was uh, quite active for about six weeks. And that is a very long time that most no more I mean, communications were not properly by commercial communications. Uh, definitely, even that we were prepared, we, we, nobody can be prepared for a catastrophe like that you have to attend 20, 70 hospitals or 3 million people, citizens across the whole uh, territory of Puerto Rico in 72 counties. Uh, the, there were several things that they are extremely important, thanks to the WinLink. We were affected with the uh, ham radio community, local ones, that they were exhausted within the after two weeks. And then it came what it was called the force of 50, that they were actually 23 people. But they did perform amazingly. These people work and we were working together, getting the communications, whatever was needed, supporting EFS2, the uh, Red Cross, and trying to save lives. And believe me, we lost about 4,500 lives due after the aftermath of the hurricane. Uh, and we, I don't want to get there because that, that would be a different presentation. But the most important part that the digital communication plays a big role to get the needs from the mayors, from different uh, from the different towns and, 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 and hospitals as well because there were no communication. Things were traveling by messengers and that was really most needed. And one of the things that we were, I came back to Hank. We lost Oscar. Sorry about that. Oscar just went away. Okay, Tim, um, why don't you pick it up? You have a, your hand up. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering is uh, how far along are we looking at uh, um, having them to radio operators follow the NIMS typing type of model and basically to have people actually uh, have certain qualifications, certain capabilities, everything like that before they're actually, actually designated for employment, employment so that as, again, instead of doing it, it ad hoc. That is an excellent question, Tim. The, um... Actually, John Peterson, who you probably know, works the Oxcom program at uh, CISA, is responsible for getting that done the, um, in coordination with FEMA. So he, that would be, he, he'd be the best person to answer that question. But I know he's working on it because I saw a draft of a, a position uh, description not long ago. And so 
he has to coordinate that to get it in the NIMS system, the NIMS uh, typing system, which is a painful process, as you probably know, to get any of them done. And it takes a while, but that's one of the issues that did come out of the, uh, the same public notice that we sent out from the uh, Hurricane Maria, same thing. Uh, we need to have that, and that should be in the FEMA system, absolutely. <clears throat> Okay, I don't see any more hands up. Barry, what do you got in text? Hello, Barry. Anything in chat there, Barry? It looks like we might have lost Barry, too. <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> okay. This guy is a, in, in a, a particular time zone, Eastern time zone, getting hit pretty hard here. Um, trying to see where we last left off. I know you can't see when you've got your your screen showing there. Um, are you is this presentation done at this time? As far as your screen share goes, Mark. Say again. Does it what? Are your is your presentation done as far as the screen? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Lower your screen, and you you'll be able to see everything that we're seeing. Oh, okay. Let me stop sharing. There we go. There we go. That? Now now you should be able to. Click on chat down below on your screen there and pull up and you see all the stuff that we're looking at. Chat, chat, chat. It's, uh, okay. it's, I see it. Okay, good. All right. I think we're good. Yeah. I did, I, Marty has a question. He put a question earlier. Is there a need for, I don't know what, Disaster spectrum deconflication is on the ground early. Deconfliction. Can you explain what that is? Sure. Bart knows what that is, too. So when uh, he knows. So when you get a disaster, you get all of these agencies and organizations that come into an area with their radio system or with their radio equipment. And... Uh, you know, there has to be that there has to be that one ringleader that goes and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you turn that P-25 on, come see me or before you turn that radio on and start using it. Let me know. Um, Texas was like that with Harvey, um, uh, Puerto Rico. They had some deep confliction issues in Puerto Rico. They were solved. Both of those were solved pretty quickly. But um, the need to have that that early on. Um, because there is this willingness to be compassionate, to show up and help. And um, maybe Bart has something to say about it. But, I, yeah. you know, having that early on so you get you avoid the interference is very important. That is. You're absolutely right. And not just the uh, frequency deconfliction, but also the, uh, the actual placement of the antennas yep. for these transmitters because they can't be too close. They can't be interfering with each other. And you also have... Uh, you know the frequencies that are um, that are related to harmonics. I mean, there are a lot of things to look at when you have, when you want to deconflict something. When you have a lot of agencies or or just transmitters working close to each other and that's, beam that's, antennas. That's, that's, yeah, don't show don't show up and set up your mobile two meter radio right next to the airport just because it's flat. I mean, bad <laughs> bad idea. Okay, <laughs> that that's the reason why state governments and county governments and other critical infrastructure uh, properly with a 205 out of a 217 and uh, have a COMEL that understands all of this and brings this process forward. As far as amateur radio goes, um, the best education that I've experienced or know anything about has been the uh, uh, course, uh, I can't think of the name of it, it's a, a 300, ICS 300, and the follow-up 400. They're transformative because they uh, teach the amateur radio operator um, along with the people that they're going to be working with um, how to go through the process to make certain that those conflicts are minimized. There's always going to be conflicts, obviously. But when you get the federal government involved and um, uh, 
the military and everybody else. Uh, and nobody is in charge of the entire process other than perhaps an IT uh, individual. Um, things like that are going to occur. And I don't know whether or not our government uh, has preparation for such uh, instances as Puerto Rico was. Um, I know that they do have on domestic uh, uh, multi-state uh, incidents and they work those things out, uh, whether it's a Super Bowl or a multi, multi uh, state disaster, they work those things out. But there is a ICS process now that does assist in making those things, uh, making the collisions less. And uh, as hams, the best thing we can do, in my opinion, is to make certain that we have, take advantage of all those courses that uh, the agencies want us to take uh, and if possible to go to some of these uh, now they're virtual classroom courses uh, and I don't know how frequent they are anymore with the pandemic but sooner or later they'll come back and when they do uh, anybody that really has an interest in in all of this I highly recommend the 300 I says 300 course. Uh, and I don't know who agrees with me or who doesn't, but uh, that's just been my experience. Well, Steve, I would say I support what you said 100%. I'll go even further than that. Um, when you take your ICS 300 and 400, take it where you live. Don't go up north or south for east or west of where you live. Take it right where you live because you will meet the officials normally at the state level that will coordinate with you. and relationship building is so important in amateur radio MCOM it's I can't overemphasize it I was the uh, EC for my county for 10 years and I was also the DEC and I worked as an ASM also but the, the, the one of the main duties you have is maintaining relationships and asking your emergency manager hey what can I do for you what will you need I mean we'll sweep the floor whatever you need and that kind of attitude goes a long ways because they are, just to give us an example, they gave us the keys, literally the keys to their operations center 24 seven and a uh, access card, electronic access card. Anytime we wanted to go in there, we could go in there, in their op center. That's pretty significant for a, a county to allow that. So, and that's all about relationship building, being nice and, and getting along because I have some war stories that I could tell you about hams that don't get along very well when I was a cop, but. That is so important that I can't emphasize that enough. And the COM-T and COM-L courses, especially the COM-L, very, very worth taking. I mean, you will learn some very interesting things, current technology, what's being used in your area, especially, not necessarily, because every area uses different stuff, different equipment. So it's just my opinion, but it's what I've seen that's very helpful. Very good, very good conversations here. Uh, Barry, you want to make sure we're okay in the in the chat. Marty, you want to go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate one more time here. So, you know, we hams are asked to do crossband exercises, and uh, you know, we do that we do that in a very friendly way once a year. We talk to the National Weather Service, but um, I see there is a great great benefit. Used, you, you know, the 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 uh, you know, state, local, tribal, territorial, you got your frequencies that you operate on. We got our frequency, you know, ours, meaning all the hams that are here today. So there's the amateur radio band and there's the ones that are not amateur radio bands. And we listen to yours and you listen to us and we can communicate and we can do it pretty quickly without some sort of temporary authority having to be set up. And everybody gets on there and, you know, do you see that cross band as being, a, as being beneficial or, I mean, we, we do it, but you might hear often, it's like, well, we do all this training, but we never get to use it. But then you hear here, it's like, well, you, you fight like you train. Is cross band on anybody's mind or does it, is it just a, a nice thing to have? I think a lot of organizations use cross band. It's very, obviously very, very useful. And uh, especially when it works <laughs> and you're right. within range and everything. I think it's, uh, but I don't, I haven't seen any issues. I can't think of any uh, issues. Uh, Steve, can you think of anything? 
Well, Jack or Steve, yeah, Steve mentioned 205, and and right away comes to mind is, in, in earlier in the whole, this presentation, you talked about designated frequencies. If you're not at the state level, like me as being a section manager, if I'm not telling my section emergency coordinator, hey, you got the state 205, we'll take that state 205 and give it to the SWIC or give it to somebody at the state level and make sure that we are in alignment, okay? It's not just it's not just your county and they decided we're going to use whatever it is. In other words, there has to be that level of sharing and, and cooperation that says this is what we're going to be doing when we need to use it. Oh, when you said crossband, I thought you meant like using from two meters to 440. I'm right. talking. No, I'm talking about even HF. I'm talking. <laughs> I'm talking. You've got you've got the uh, you know, you've got the uh, the National Guard sitting in. Uh, in uh, Des Moines, or in I love the title. It's a Sheboygan. I like just like the name of the city. Sitting in Sheboygan, and they're trying to communicate RF wise. I'm think. I mean HF wise. Bart, I'm thinking HF. I mean, I get the I get the 220, 440. I get all of that part. But I'm talking about the HF side. Utilize. I got a, I got a, com I got a comment or two about all that. I'm uh, sure you do. Go ahead, buddy. <laughs> okay, on uh, Winlink. On Winlink. Uh, we've been thinking about that for years, and uh, uh, there are exercises on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and I'm going to compile them and send them out before too long, uh, where different groups, uh, Cal OES, uh, FEMA Region 5, uh, it goes on and on, uh, have wind link exercises where um, if a ham stays on the ham band, he can he can send a message to a share station or to anybody else uh, because it's going through the internet. Uh, li likewise, if a, uh, if a, he can use RF to bridge to the internet, if he's in a exercise disaster zone or real life disaster zone, he can email anybody, including a share station, as long as the share station abides by the shares rules and picks up, that message on the shares channels, there's complete interoperability. Uh, then there's 60 meters, which uh, we kind of play around with and do periodic uh, national exercises uh, here and there. But that's another, uh, and for, unfortunately, it's a fixed propagation situation. But uh, as far as uh, um, <clears throat> using the bill box or anything else to to take a an amateur radio frequency and cross band it with a public safety frequency that still is taboo, and uh, uh, I think that it does require a waiver or uh, an STA in order to be able to do that. I can think of one incident where that was accomplished uh, very quickly uh, by calling the FCC watch, um, but for the most part. Um, it is not. It is not. Um, and the reason why it's not, again, is because of the severe content restriction that is imposed on the amateur frequencies. Um, there's just no way to hide what you say uh, legally. Uh, uh, and so the, all of this, all of these things all hinge not on desire or need. They hinge on the ability to change. Uh, what has been set as rules in the past uh, to new rules. And that, again, requires uh, a call to the FCC. Okay. Interesting. Thanks, Jack. Okay. Thanks. Before we go too much farther, we need to get Oscar back in here and so he can uh, follow up with his thoughts as he was doing this here. Oscar? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, guys, for getting disconnected. Uh, one of the things that, in a, again, I have to stress the uh, how Winlink works so well to transfer the information from hospital, the mayors to the uh, FEMA and the state government and, and taking care and working together with the FS2 team. And the, and the amateurs, our local amateurs were really exhausted after two weeks and having the banking or down for four weeks. Uh, there was no money running, so they run out of gasoline and whatever money they have, they have to spend it with their family and no more volunteer work. 
that's the reason that we got the good team force of 50 and some of them that they survive and and that's about uh, 200 amateurs across the state and they did support they did support uh the the emergency communications especially the most important part of when you have to send a message and have to be correct and, and the operator doesn't put an input on it you just get the message and get it through and hospital blood or whatever was required generators or medicines or emergency transfer from patients that power failure on the hospital and things like that there are a lot of stories that i can tell you about that uh the interesting part is that there were designated frequencies on the spot locally in the island, like 145.52. And that was the main frequency being utilized simply because there were no repeaters working for, for about three weeks. The other part uh, definitely that works well is in HF. And we were actually getting the information uh, uh, by voice and then transferred by one link. And from the faraway towns of the near islands related to the uh, territory of Puerto Rico, requesting the needs uh, again by HF. And it happens to be that everybody respect those emergency frequency, five kilohertz up and up and down. For example, for example in 40 meters, uh, we were mostly there, was 7.085. And they were, they, that channel, that frequency was clear all day long. South America, Venezuela, Colombia, uh, Costa Rica, I mean, everybody, even in, in small islands, they, nobody got nearby except for trying to help or relaying information or keeping those frequency open, uh, respecting the emergency. And that you have seen, I'm sure that many DXR have seen that happening worldwide. People, HAMA operators, they do respect emergency frequencies. And that, we have to applaud that. Uh, and again, uh, the, the important part that I went back uh, on the hankation and by can testify that I was there talking 20 minutes how why we don't make teams of people that we can train and they can move with the equipment and train the people locally because you move it and you put it to work you put the station but remember there's a culture in every territory and you cannot go there and take control of it and but if you help the amateurs on that territory and put put it to run and they know and they, they have to harvest the people that come to help you because if you send any helper into any territory without the proper support they can lose the money the gear that they have the equipment the money the, the the goods and the food whatever he has carrying he's in the danger zone so people have to harvest him so but again also they need the this team of emergency communication responders to help the impact zone as soon as possible, even before it happens, if it's possible. So again, those are some of my comments and probably one of these days we're going to give a, a, one presentation about Hurricane Maria. I think it's the right time for it. So back to you, Bart, and th great. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Thank you, Oscar, appreciate it. <clears throat> wow. Yeah, the Dan has his hand up, Dan. Yeah, we got a couple of up here, very took his hand away. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, I could I could say three phrases or I could explain things a little more. <laughs> Marty, look up ICS 217A, a state that has a state 205 is a state that's really hurting. Um, and Bart, and I guess everybody has heard me say this before, except you, Bart. <laughs> but, I, I think our highest value as amateur radio operators is that we're more or less ubiquitously dispersed throughout the United States and its territories. So we're there and we're going to be the first ones talking when nothing else is working. Yeah, the um, government doesn't like that because we can't control you. <laughs> well, I'm a retired Fed and I know all about not being able to control anything. <laughs> We can't control Dan with anything. He's just uncontrollable. <laughs> and, and, and the last observation is, I get the sense that we're always trying to come up with a single solution for making the best use of amateur radio. And that's never going to happen. I mean, what are we, 58 states, five, six territories, 2,000 and some counties? There's going to be different solutions scaled to the problem. And we can't fixate on you know, one dicta or another, or we're going to be tripping over ourselves. So I'm really in favor of things like 
ARRL actually doing what it claims it does versus wasting money, time, and uh, amateur resources in the terms of liveware throughout the United States fiddling around with their committees. And I'm more enthused about Oxcom, CISA Oxcom, and shares because that, I think, has immediate and more tangible payback. But if we're going to save ARRL, we have a lot of work to do. And uh, I'll also say I can't speak highly enough of Jim Coleman, and I'll just leave it with that. Okay. I'll let you comment there, Bart, and then we'll pick up Larry. Yeah, th thanks for your comment. Uh, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, every state has its own way of doing things, and we can't dictate it what states should do. All we can do is offer help and, and advice in general terms, but not in specific terms. We should, the federal government, in my opinion, should not be dictating to states everything that they need to do. But as time goes on, you'll notice that the, the Tenth Amendment has, has been ignored, ignored quite a bit. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> I like that. Larry, go ahead. I have a uh, basically more of a comment, although I do do appreciate this part. Uh, I've done a number of ad hoc show ups at certain areas, uh, constraints and incidents up here using uh, ham radios and it was always praised. But when you go back and revisit them to say, hey, let's figure out a MOU or something like that, either the person who thought it was so great is gone or they, well, we'll get back to you. That's another issue altogether. We have to cross that bridge. But uh, I, I'm also, because I was uh, in the Navy with the CBs in an intelligence group in uh, Vietnam, I agree with your training. I, and it's hard to convince people about that. But the one thing is you've got to remember, everything is local. But we can sure use a good blueprint from above because that gets the attention of the bureaucrats between where I'm at and where whoever else is at. Because they don't seem to act unless somebody says, hey, you need to do this. <laughs> so, Larry, I was, yes, in Fubai, I was in Fubai and Da Nang. Where were you? <laughs> First trip was in Da Nang, second trip up in Quezon. Wow. I was over on uh, by uh, China Beach when I was in down in Da Nang. Okay. Uh, you open up a door to this with this age of people. You have a lot of people down there. Four stories here in a minute here. <laughs> what what uh, what Steve is saying, what uh, Larry is saying, and what Dan is saying uh, has a lot of a lot of merit. We need leadership and guidance from the top. Uh, we like to see it come from the RRL. We like to see them not just spin your wheels for weeks and months on end, doing nothing but these committee things, bashing ideas, and doing nothing else. We need to have something coming down the like line from them and from other agencies. We need that guidance. We can break it down to our local uh, needs, but we have to have the basic structure. And it's a lot of cases it's missing and has been for some time. So we have a pretty rough structure, if you will, across the United States of what works and doesn't work. Uh, Dan? Yes, sir. I believe that uh, in order for an organization to lead, they have to do first. Or if they don't have that interest, they have to at least uh, bring in people who do uh, the work and have done the work and know what they're doing and take their advice, choosing each other for committees and then coming up with uh, alternatives without having any experience whatsoever in a real world environment is not gonna make, uh, it's not gonna make it with these agencies. So I agree with whoever made the statement about Oxcom, uh, that program um, is not perfect uh, but it is uh, the real deal, and the people who are behind it are the people who are making policy uh, with NIMS and other uh, processes that are used in real life, uh, and not just uh, to fill out a task book or to get a credit or to get a badge to wear, an orange badge to wear. This, this is a, a serious matter to these guys. It's their job. If they don't do it right, they're gone, and uh, they want to make 
darn sure that their support structure um, is going to work. So uh, that that's all. Uh, it's just the way it is. And they they can have all the committee people can have all the committees and make all the internal decisions and put it out there. But if the customer, the agencies don't buy it, it doesn't make any difference. Might sell a few books. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thanks for the pep talk, Steve. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. No, I'm, 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 I'm just joking. I this know, has been I great. Th thank you all for all the volunteer time you put. You, you put in hundreds, thousands of hours in getting this done and making it work. It's, it's all because of you guys that anything happens at all. <clears throat> well, I'd like to say and thank. This is the kind of conversations, the kind of things we need to have on a national level uh, where we can discuss things in the open freely and, and uh, uh, work together. And uh, of course, you always know that we put this out in video afterwards. This also shows up on YouTube. And hopefully we'll get the interest and in, uh, the stuff going that we need to have for this stuff. Yeah, I'm preparing for retirement in case they don't like what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I, if you retire, take the retirement, have you know, have the lifestyle you want, and then volunteer and keep things going. <laughs> we'll all be so Dan. We'll all be showing up in dark sunglasses the next time you have one of these and have the feds on. Okay? Every time I thought I really wanted to retire, they promoted me. <laughs> I think in in Bart's case, it's not so much him wanting to retire. They're wanting to retire him if he said the wrong things tonight. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a good one. And uh, we'd like to, uh, if there's no more comments or questions, uh, we'll probably should start looking at wrapping it up. Is there any, any, I see another message just popped in at the bottom. One new message it says. Okay, it just says, thank you, Bart. We're gonna have a lot of that. Any more um, uh, comments or, or is it? Uh, one, is uh, it? One, last, one last, thank you again for putting these series together uh, and uh, allowing us to do this. Uh, we've had a lot of different states with a lot of commonality. Uh, there's no question about what it is that the government, state governments want. Um, we haven't heard from all of them, but those that have uh, any ESF2 function at all in their state uh, are going to be consistent with the various four or five states that we've heard and the, and the, the state that we'll hear from uh next thursday so um i really, really want to thank you for giving the amateur community the opportunity to hear it from the horse's mouth uh where you know that oh i hate to use that but i don't really know a better where the rubber meets the road uh, because these are the people that are going to be there uh when we are or are not depending upon how we respond to them Thank you. There was one question in the chat that maybe someone could comment on. It's and it's there. I guess it would be a public. Is there a public hotline to the FCC in emergencies? Uh, no, actually, in emergencies, we shut down all our phone lines, so nobody will call us. Now I'm joking. There is a there is an 800 number that is available 24 seven, um, and actually, you can call our operations center at uh, 202 418. 1122 because I call that a lot and they're all, they run 24/7 uh, we have watch officers there and they do a very good job and they're the ones you call after hours to get a waiver or a special temporary authority to do something and so yeah there's all you can call us 24/7 happy holidays <laughs> all right thank hey, you all for coming yes thank you everyone Pre Art, sure. thank you for uh, thank you for game throwing the dice and we really appreciate it. Yes, and a special thanks to Bart. I'm gonna end this now, say 73s everybody, as soon as I can grab my, get the few things out of the way. <laughs> my, 73 and good evening, everybody. Yes, thanks, 73s Steve. everybody, thanks for thank the you, uh, information. 73s all, thank you all. Stay safe everybody, take care. 73.